Hi, I'm Zach Shelby, and welcome to Machine Learning on the Edge, where we bring industry, business, and technology leaders together to talk about data and machine learning, how we're putting technology to use in real industries. And today, it's a pleasure to invite Kate Kallet. Hi, Zach. Hi, co-founder and CEO of Amini, um, to the show. Welcome. Thank you, Zach. Thank you for having me. Really excited to be here. Before we dive into Africa and technology and this this little <laughs> this little nano satellite that we have with us, our first nano satellite on this show. But yeah. Um, tell me about your connection with Africa and your journey through through the silicon industry. Yeah. So for this, I have to go back many years before I was even born um, to my grandfather's day, um, and uh, my family is originally from Central African Republic. And my grandfather, back in the days, was the first um, African graduate from the National Police School in France. And then he went on to studying in the US, Washington Police Academy, Indiana Police Academy, and started working for Interpol. He had an amazing international career, but still decided to go back to Central African Republic to apply everything he had learned to his country. Unfortunately, he was killed by the dictator in the days, but in those days, and, and our family, my grandma and her five kids were put in civilian residence at the border of Sudan before they could escape to France because they had the French citizenship because he was working for Interpol. But you know, my grandfather's journey has always been at the back of my mind and has always been a model that I've tried to live by and replicate, which means learning what I'm learning in um, where I grew up in the Silicon Valley or the Silicon industry and then moving back to, to, to Africa. So I started my career at Intel, um, started my career at Intel in France, moved across uh, Europe, got into machine learning very early uh, back in the Movidius days, um, launching the first uh, AI development kit in a USB form factor. I was the product manager for this neural compute stick very, very <laughs> a long time ago. Um, but very exciting journey, and that taught me about hardware and software until I moved to ARM. Moved to ARM um, was also at the very beginning when ARM was starting their machine learning journey and, and, um, and building that machine learning ecosystem. One of the things I learned at ARM and one of the triggers that I had um, was around the use cases of AI and machine learning in Africa. You know, when we talk about the tiny machine learning movement, when you talk about edge processing, you realize that this technology has more use cases in places where you don't always have access to connectivity. You know, you've worked on some camera traps. Imagine those camera traps in the bush, in the field in Kenya, being able to um, be smarter thanks to machine learning processing, right? Um, so that had a trigger on me. And um, we did this trip with UNICEF in 2019. I remember this. You remember this, yeah. right? We took a bunch of ARM executives and went to Malawi for a couple of days, um, sitting down with the populations, trying to understand the challenges they were facing and how the technology we were building could be applied to that. And at that time, I came back to, to Cambridge and I was like, I'm quitting everything. <laughs> I just want to go where I'm the most needed. <laughs> and uh, one of my former colleagues who used to work in the nonprofit space before told me, stop. And she said to me, look, I've been on the other side. And the other side actually doesn't design, build, it only deploys. Where you are right now is where you can actually make a difference. And that for me was the pivot where everything was lining up my grandfather's journey and my family history, then my technology journey, and also my drive to have an impact on this world. And, um, and that's when I decided to start focusing on Africa and on emerging markets. Um, and then I joined NVIDIA to do that, support NVIDIA to expand in, in those regions. Um, and, um, and at some point I had another trigger, which was um, my time on Necker Island. Richard Branson at that time was, uh, was putting together an event and I was talking about, um, I was presenting about AI in Africa over the next 10 years, training the next generations of AI thinkers and how this technology could help accelerate economic development on the continent. And when I came back to New York, my apartment, I, uh, I started thinking to myself, what am I doing here? And that's how 
you ended up moving to Nairobi. Exactly. That's how I ended up moving to Nairobi. And that's how, that's how I decided to make the step, make the jump, um, and, uh, and take as a, as a baggage everything that I had learned to go and apply to the continent. So let's talk about startup diversity, right? Like we tend to think of startups as being a Silicon Valley thing. And for a long time, you know, it was, right? You needed to be in the Valley to get funding and to scale up and to find the talent. Um, but now we're again seeing startups being founded all over the world by lots of different types of founders. Like what is your your own view and journey into, you know, being a startup founder, doing it your own way on the African continent? I think um, that's a great question. I think for startups to succeed or succeed in driving innovation, you need diversity. You need diversity of backgrounds. You need diversity of thoughts because what we build is what looks like us, right? Everything that we're putting into our journey, everything that we're putting into the problem we're trying to solve is something that's usually personal. It's a problem we've encountered throughout our journey. And the way we go about solving this problem is by often using things that we've learned in the past. So when you build a startup, actually, you're building kind of a version of yourself. <laughs> I don't know if you agree with that, Jim Paul. I do, actually, yeah. <laughs> we always end up building developer tooling for some reason, every time. So, yeah. It is, right? So, for me, if you look at Amini, Amini is actually a combination of everything I've done before. So, I spoke about the journey of my grandfather and my ties to Africa, my family's ties to Africa, and my personal ties as well to Africa. But when you lay over my entire tech journey from Intel, then going into edge processing, edge computing, going into ARM and the impact of ARM's technology on billions of people across the world. And then when you lay over NVIDIA with the GPUs and you look at Amini, it's actually a combination of this entire, yes. So it's, it's, Amini is kind of a version of myself, but it's a version of myself that's solving a problem that I'm passionate about and driven and I really wanna be solving for the continent. Yeah, and I think there's a, especially when we're solving problems for regional issues, right? You really need to be inside that problem, understand it, have team members who are who are understanding that problem inside and out. You can't really solve it from the outside. So this isn't a problem, you know, data scarcity for Africa, Africa isn't a problem that a team from the valley can just solve without having any context. So you doing it as you, right, with your background, and doing it from Nairobi, right, is the only right way to go do it and, and win. It is. And when you look at, uh, at my team, they're all brilliant talent from the continent, have worked from some of the biggest tech companies, could be working in mm -hmm. the Valley, right? But all decided to also put their minds towards solving a challenge that they knew, a problem that they also knew, because it's a problem that's pervasive across the, across the continent. We have some of our engineers, their parents or their grandparents were farmers or pastoralists. So they've seen those challenges and they know what to build to be able to solve a problem that their parents or their grandparents were facing. And that's the beauty of technology for me. I think it's a positive trend post COVID. <clears throat> we've seen a distribution of not only talent, but a distribution of VC funding. Yeah. We're seeing a distribution of kind of acceptance of where startups are founded, where they're based, where their teams are. And I think that's a really positive step. I've always had one foot in Europe and in Finland, where I started my first startups, and one foot in the valley. Yeah. Um, and that's something I've had to struggle with in the past, right? Like, how can I have my European talent that I have access to, my knowledge of, of the continent, and right, make use of access to Silicon Valley? And post-pandemic, it just started to work. Before it was a struggle, and now it really comes together in a very positive way. Talent and, and kind of background from Europe with funding and ambition from the U.S., it's a really beautiful balance. I think you're doing the same kind of thing with Amini and Africa, right? You're taking U.S. and European technology, yes, access to funding, um, 
and applying it to your team who has the domain and, and regional knowledge in Africa to solve this problem. Absolutely. So now is the time to be doing exactly what you're doing. It is, and now is the time. I would encourage actually other founders who are hesitating um, to make that steps. It's the time. There is this energy that's building and everybody now is starting to understand and comprehend that technology can be applied in different ways, um, but also innovation can be driven in different ways in different parts of the world. So it is the time. This is one of these things that if you haven't started a startup before, you don't realize there is this trigger point, right? There is this point of no return when a problem that you're passionate about just becomes so immense in your mind. It's almost like a disruption point that <laughs> it usually comes in the sense of frustration. <laughs> That's usually how it's worked for me. Like, oh, I'm going to go crazy if we don't find a way to solve this problem. Um, and then you realize that, wow actually, maybe I should solve this problem. And I think that's what happened here for you as well with the data scarcity problem. And that's what a mini is all about, yes. right? Yeah. Using data specifically for the African continent. Yeah. Um, what is the data scarcity problem? Like, what's that, that problem that inspired you to go create the company? You know, um, having been in that field for a very long time, I've seen the evolution of AI and machine learning. And when you see the world that we have today, we know that it has only been possible because of the availability or the Cambrian explosion of data, hmm. let me call it, right? And um, for some reasons for Africa, it hasn't happened yet. And Africa as a continent, one, some of the things that a lot of people do not know is that the continent relies on agriculture. Agriculture is the pulmon of our economies. Africa is a continent where 60% of our population are smallholder farmers. It still represents 65% of the world's uncultivated arable land, which becomes important when you start thinking about food security and water scarcity that the world is facing or is about to face in a few years. Um, Africa is also 30% of the world's um, mineral resources. Africa feeds the world and it all relies on Africa's environmental wealth. Mm -hmm. Africa is a continent that's extremely rich in natural resources. So when you think about all these statistics and you see, you lay on top of this the fact that the lack of data has hampered a lot of the investments because, you know, data creates trust. Data creates transparency, creates trust, and then ultimately foster investments and economic development. And for us, if the continent hasn't been able to develop itself the past couple of years, it's because of the lack of this environmental data. Um, so when we started looking into, I was obsessed with making an impact on the continent, right? So when I started looking into where are my skills, my brains, the best applied and everything I've learned in the past, the best applied, I first wanted to start building a company, an AI company. And I said, okay, I'm going to build an AI company, but an AI company doing what? Mm -hmm. Looking into building maybe um, early warning systems, looking into building weather forecasts. And you're like, okay, I'm trying to do this, but I can't actually put my hands on high quality data. And that's when I decided to pivot towards building that data infrastructure to solve that environmental data scarcity. And from an infrastructure standpoint, you think when you think about infrastructure here, you think about data centers, supercomputers. <laughs> when we're actually looking at infrastructure there, we look at infrastructure that can generate the types of data we need. Geospatial, infrastructure, having data from satellite, high quality data from satellites, but also a data aggregation platform because data from satellite is not enough. You need to be able to calibrate with ground truth. You need to, able to, you need to be able to integrate data from sensors, you need to, to be able to in, integrate weather data, fusion all that data, and being able to provide those high quality data sets and machine learning analytics to be able to build solutions and services to serve the people. So you're building this data platform solution, yeah. taking into account like remote imaging, satellite imagery, remote sensing, so IoT data, kind of fusing that all together. What kind of industries and business problems are you going to solve with this? You know, data is the start of everything. So as we collect data for hundreds of millions of smallholder farmers, for example, 
at a highly granular way, at a farm level, we're able to understand crop health, we're able to understand soil health, water usage, um, but also fertilizer use. Mm -hmm. um, that same data, that data we collect, we can provide to banks to be able to design um, loans against or provide farmers with loans against assets. Are we able to provide that same data to insurances to build crop insurance products for farmers? That same data aggregated at a country level goes to a government, a government to be able to better understand food security across the entire country. Kenya right now is victim of El Nino, which is impacting the entire food production across the entire country. So we were able to run analysis to understand how exactly El Nino will impact maize production in Kenya. Maize is the, is the crops that's the, the most grown across the, across the country. And that same data, again, can go to a private sector company that has a supply chain on the continent. You know, the continent feeds the entire world. Coffee, cocoa, maize, rice, all our agricultural commodities that come from the continent. So a company with a supply chain on the continent is now able to understand what's happening at the farm level, which becomes very important on one side for regulators, but on the other side um, to be able to support the transition towards regenerative agriculture and support building more resilience for their farmers. Because again, that same data can go to a farmer to increase productivity and profits. And what's the state of the art today when, when those of us in the US or in Europe think about farms and farm data, what's the reality of small hold farm and the data available and the data available to insurers and to banks and the government? Like what is the state of the art today that you're replacing? It's almost non-existent. Data is either not available or extremely difficult to access. You know, most of the data infrastructure, including satellite constellations that have been built, have been built here. Just like most of the advanced computing platforms that have been built, have been built here in the US, right? So Africa doesn't have access to that. And uh, when you look at, um, at smallholder farmers, all the differences between farming in the US and farming in Africa, here when you drive around, you will see mega farms, mega farms planting one crop. If you drive around Kenya, you will see extremely full, small farms one by one square kilometers, mil multiple crops around. So a farmer can plant maize on one corner, but can plant tea on the other corner. So solving for that and also making sure that in our technology and the way we build our technology and our company, we integrate all these insights and those differences that the continent face that are pretty much proper to our continent was very important. So solving for um, the uniqueness of the African continent and our population, but also solving for the scale of the African continent. One of the things often people fail to realize is how big this continent is. In the continent, you can fit US, Europe, India, China, all of it together. So it's a very, very big and wide continent that has more than a billion people. Um, so being able to solve for that scale was also important. Now. If you also look into what the, that data scarcity has prevented, today only 20% of those farmers have access to insurance. And the reason why only 20% of these farmers have access to any kind of insurance, it's because there is a data scarcity, because insurers haven't been able to access the data that they need to design insurance products that are tailored to farmers and farmers that are hard to reach. So this is, um, the type of challenges that are mini solving, but also for us, the long-term vision is if we go about solving that infrastructure, if we go about putting out high quality data sets, machine learning analytics across the entire continent, we will see other startups, other developers, other students building on top of our platform and building on top of our data, developing solutions and services for their own country, for their own communities, and really accelerate the development of the continent. So it becomes a platform play for data as well. So it becomes a platform play. We love developers, both of us. So we're really opening up African data also for other developers. Yes. So let's talk about the satellite that you yes. brought with us. <laughs> this is amazing. So we have a, a, a nanosat. Yes. 
you're going to launch a satellite constellation for Africa? Yes, we will. <laughs> we are about to launch uh, Africa's first constellation of nanosatellites that will be solely dedicated to monitoring environmental data across the entire continent. And what does that mean for the improvements in data availability for the platform you're building? And what does it mean for AI? Because I'm really interested just as an engineer, right? Yes. How does AI help us optimize kind of satellite constellation yeah. data collection? So for us, um, when it comes to the data, you know, we are using open source data today from NASA, from the European Space Agency. Um, but the problem with that data is that it's not continuous. The resolution is not good enough. Um, and it triggers issues also with accuracy, right? So um, for us, going into launching our own constellation of, of nanosatellites will allow us to improve all these things, improve the quality of the data that's flowing into our platform. So then the services that are being built upon are better, mm -hmm. but also we able to unlock new use cases. So for example, one of the exciting things we're doing with our, with our constellation is that, you know, before I jump in, into space tech, <laughs> we understood when you look at the entire edge processing pipeline um, and why moving from cloud to the edge, there are issues with bandwidth, latency, cost of cloud computing. You know, we know the story, right? It turns out that for space, it's actually the same thing. There are issues with bandwidth, latency, cost of like storing data on the clouds. Yeah, you need to communicate with the satellite exactly. in order to get um, your downlink image data back down to your data centers. Yes. Um, how do we overcome some of those problems? And how do we overcome some of these problems by doing the exact same thing we did on the ground is by doing edge processing, but this time in orbit. So with our constellation, we will be doing edge processing in orbit, which will allow us to run analytics on the fly and only extract the results of this analytics, download the results of this analytics. So now all of a sudden you don't actually have to download the images, which are extremely big. You only download the results. And when you're doing analytics on hundreds of millions of farms across the entire continent, this is what matters. And so we're putting NVIDIA GPUs. Yes. Inside of the NanoSat. <laughs> yes. In developing I'm guessing very fine-grained, even customer-specific yes. edge machine learning models, pushing those into the nanosat and then getting just the inference results out of that. Exactly. And on top of this, um, one of the a couple of other use cases that this will enable is early warning systems. Being able to build early warning systems and being also able to forecast extreme weather events things that we didn't have access to today um, uh, on the continent. And when you think about being able to get that data and put that data in the hands of people, imagine the impact this will have in the future. Yeah, and the things that they'll invent exactly. with that data that we could never invent. That, and that's something that inspires me, building Edge Impulse as a founder. It's like, wow, if we open up artificial intelligence as an engineering tool for all the world's engineers, you know, think of what they can create. And we've already started to see that effect. So you're doing the same for data in Africa. Yes, we are. Exciting. Kate, thank you so much for being on the show with me. Thank you. Um, do I keep the, get to keep the satellite? No, I'm going cool. back with the satellite. You have to but... return the satellite. Okay. <laughs> I need to find my own satellite. This is very cool. I need one at home. Uh, thank you for being on the show. Thank um, you, Zach. Always a pleasure to see you. Always. And welcome back um, next month for our next episode of Machine Learning on the Edge. Until then, take care.